I started, I didn't know a single other author to talk to, to, you know, and I met some on, yeah. uh, in person, but there wasn't like an online, there wasn't a way to Format. meet people. Yeah. And now it's, you know, I, I get a lot of feedback and a lot of um, help from other authors who, you know, who are, I, w- I will say this about the romance community 100% is that they are the most supportive. A high tide lifts all boats is absolutely the mantra of most yeah. romance authors yeah, I know. absolutely. So, you know. So just in terms of, again, a practicality, because when we write scripts, generally there's sometimes multiple people that break the story, but you take on all of the this happens and this happens and this happens, beginning, middle, end. That's all coming from From up up there. (laughs) Yeah, because we do the same thing. I mean, we will start with sort of a pitch, a page that's the, this is the beginning, middle, end. And then it'll kind of flush out to treatment. And then at that point, the treatment could pass hands to another screenwriter because it's all Mm -hmm. sort of there and the worlds are there. It's interesting, the writer's room, it would be so, I feel like so many problematic books that get published or, or you know, self-publishers who then yank their book down because it, it was such a problematic book. It would be, a writer's room would be so interesting to be yeah. inside of. I yeah. think, tell us more. So, <laughs> so the thing about a writer's room is we bring together about three to four writers and we're sort of all kind of writing together. I'll just say, just for interest's sake, like uh, every big sitcom you watch on primetime television has about somewhere between 18, 16, and 18 people in the room. So, but, well, I mean, it's just, it kind of takes a village and it's sort of what, you know, the best scripts when they're very tight have had a lot of collaboration. So learning to kind of be collaborative, and I know we have... Um, spoken to a few authors before that they have they'll have a little group there'll be six Mm -hmm. of them and then they can share chapters and get things strengthened and what we do on the tv side of things is you will kind of you will break out this story and a script can be taken through by one individual and then one of the best process that we have and we even do it on our um, on all of our romance films is do a punch-up pass which punch-up means add more jokes, twist Mm -hmm. this here, sprinkle this there, make it just a little bit, just lift the whole thing. What will happen as our scripts kind of come to finalization, after first draft, after the story points and the beats are all worked out, then we'll do this punch up pass and we'll have sometimes two to three writers look at it and they'll just pitch in jokes or they'll just pitch in a different twist of dialogue or they'll say like we have right now we're writing a, a movie franchise that actually has an LGBTQ plus character and we'll say okay now we want to make sure that this is a legitimate voice own voice coming through so we'll then work with an LGBTQ plus writer and again they'll pitch stuff in because the worst thing that we want to do and especially when it comes to inclusion and diversity, is just make it up ourselves. We want to make sure that we have the right expertise and what we are doing there. So all of those factors kind of continue to massage and make the script as, as, as it moves forward. So there's a strong voice in our scripting as we do it, but that it is a village. There is a a chorus of voices that come together, and that's what makes the best film and television. And luckily, I've been doing it for many years, and so we brought that to the romance genre, because I think it was Netflix who asked us something about a script, and I said, oh, well, we're gonna punch it up. And they said, you're gonna punch up a a rom-com? And I said, "Uh, yeah, we're gonna punch that up. (laughs) I I never called it punch-up pass, but I'm gonna use that term now. But I do that, Mm -hmm. I I definitely do a pass of the manuscript where it's just, Mm making the voice a little bit more uh, funny or more uh, lighter or any of that, and then adding jokes. I definitely mm-hmm. do a whole pass where I'm adding jokes. And then for the sensitivity stuff, we uh, I will use a sensitivity reader, nice. which is something similar to what you're saying. Yeah, they're not they're not they're not necessarily writing the pieces, but like for this book, for example, my hero, the the love interest, Mm-hmm. is a black teenager and I am not a black teenager. Right. So my main character is South Asian and the right. love interest is black and then his sister's in the book a lot too. She's a pretty pretty important character. Mm-hmm. So we sent it to a um, a queer black sensitivity reader mm-hmm. and it was so helpful to me. I learned a lot from the process. Um, just little things like language. Yeah. Um, the, the way like 
she didn't put her hand, he, he didn't run his hand through his hair. I mean, we're right. romance writers, so everybody's running their hand through their hair <laughs> constantly, <laughs> constantly <laughs> right? So just but using not the right, American hair. Just it's using the right ver yeah. verbiage yeah. to describe the, the <laughs> hand through the hair or whatever. Um, and so we definitely do that. Well, good, good writers do that. Yeah. And, and are yeah. you sourcing those people yourself, or are you getting them through publishers or editors, or how are you? Like, for this, my editor found, um, I do know that a lot of authors will get a sensitivity read before they even give the book to their editor. Really? Or before they even mm -hmm. submit to agents or anything. And it, it's it's good practice. I mean, mm -hmm. and also we pay, like we pay the person to do that. Right. We're paying an expert to help us. Right. I know a lot of people who are doing it in self-publishing and it and talking about lifting the economy. It's it's sort of created all these little niche environments where, you know, people are making money where they couldn't have made money yeah. before, which is which is pretty amazing. And they're doing fantastic work. Like the sensitivity yeah. report I got had so much history in it. Like I, mm -hmm. I literally she she had context for everything she said instead of instead of just like telling me what what could be done better she told me the reason why and she put a little history lesson in there and I was like this is so great <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. it yeah that's I think from my perspective because I own a film company I'm always thinking it's kind of a, like tentacles I feel like how much we touch other people and and just on yes on the employment side and but also to just on the creative side of things, like that that person may have had to have another job or make money in another way, but now you've allowed them to be adjacent um, to your creative life, which I think is, is a great thing. We are challenged on the film and television side of things that romance is sort of like Oh, like those m movies. So, so what are the challenges that you face when you're sort of? We have to defend it sometimes. Yeah, we I absolutely guess. do. Um, my first book, The Chai Factor, this one here, um, it was not uh, categorized as a romance. It was categorized as general fiction. I have nothing bad to say about my publisher. It was great, mm -hmm. but their Canadian lit is known for being. Um, thinking of itself as being quite highbrow, right? Right. Um, and they don't do romance. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. I'd like some of that romance money. Yeah, they they don't, don't do romance. romance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We don't do we romance. romance. But because it was a Canadian publisher, I got invited to all sorts of festivals and events, and I got to do Saving. I got to do uh, like lit festivals. Um, I got to do an event at Toronto Public Library and other libraries across like Ontario, and lots of lots and lots of great stuff. And here's me showing up and saying, "I write romance," and everyone's looking at me like, "Who is she? Who invited her?" And because I wear it proudly, I'm yes. a proud romance writer. I've never shied away from that. Um, so I was at a panel, I remember, and I did. I have received some weird questions over over time, like, "How can you call yourself a feminist when you write romance?" Wow, <laughs> that like, just is shocking to me that somebody would say that. I mean, I think we get a little bit of that sort of. It gets into a place where there's sort of this poor cousin thing, or a little bit like this cheese factor, but. Molly, have you ever been challenged about that? Like, do we speak strong enough with a woman's voice? That romance content that we're making is is not necessarily enriching to the romance fan? I think romance battles the feminism question quite a bit. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of authors who are like, in its nature, it's feminist. It's mm -hmm. books for women, about women, written by women. You don't get a whole lot more feminist than that. But there mm -hmm. is there is, there is a, a valid criticism that, you know, the patriarchy the lives you know <laughs> lives strongly it lives you know right in the middle of some of these books so um, yeah. it is it's a question that we wrestle with all the time but my stance about the books that I write and the books that I love um, is that they are deeply feminist they're mm -hmm. deeply feminist they are enlightening and enriching and exciting in ways that get frowned upon by lit fic and maybe even other genres and I think you know, you were talking about the rise of streaming services. I think you see a rise in genre content all over the yeah. place. Like, there's a huge appetite for sci-fi and, and all of these things because people love these stories. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with writing stories that people just love. <laughs> they Correct. just love them. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, too, like, when I think about our, the, what we go through on the, on the script writing side of things, so 
I mean, I've been very fortunate to have, you know, my father who was very much into social justice and my mother was a real feminist of her time, you know, 70s, burn bras, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And I think I have always been drawn to doing what I call like hands-on hip characters. And so we've all, one of the things that we chose as a company was to actually embrace networks who, who would allow us whether they knew it or not, to put very strong, intelligent females in the center focus of every one of the romance movies that we have done. Now, this may mean that we are not necessarily working with some of the biggest romance uh, networks in the world, but things like um, Netflix and some of the Lifetime uh, and certainly some of the other buyers that we worked with. And some of these we actually have male executives on. But I think, again, they're very much um, encouraging us to really break out of that mold. We do know that we have, um, you know, strong film and television entertainment brands, things like Hallmark and that, and they have hit a very nice stride in terms of this is the way that a girl looks, this is the way that a boy is cast, this is how things roll out, there's generally some gingerbread in the mix or a cookie decorating contest, <laughs> and then everything kind of comes to a lovely conclusion. And, you know, we haven't necessarily always been a, a, the right fit with those networks because we like to throw a little drama in there to put a little stakes in there, which, you know, again, whether it's holiday or whether it's straight rom-com can be challenged. Mm -hmm.